Welcome everybody to today's FDTT GOES Applications webinar. Today we're pleased to have Kristen Casty and Ashley Novak from the Weather Service Office in Wilmington, Ohio lead today's discussion which is titled A GOES 16 Perspective on a Fatal Snow Squall Event. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a few things to go over before we begin our presentation. All of these are recorded and available on the visit web pages at the URL uh, given here. And if you're interested in leading one of these in the future, just let myself, Dan Bikus, or Scott Lindstrom uh, know. Next slide. And a few. Uh, protocols to go over. We'll have about 20 minutes for our speaker. You can either send the questions via the GoToChat or we will have a Q&A period on the phone uh, as soon as they're done. Uh, we'll be done uh, by the bottom of the hour and remember do not press hold and also remember to mute your phone when not speaking. So without further ado I'll turn it over to Wilmington. Thanks so much. So uh, we're going to go through this uh, webinar. Um, again, a GO-16 perspective on a fatal snow squall event. Uh, I am Kristen Cassidy, and I'm here with uh, my colleague, Ashley Novak, who's a general forecaster. And uh, Ashley, go ahead and take it away with a little bit of snow squall information. Thanks, Kristen. Before we get into the satellite perspective of the event, we're going to take a little bit of time to look at the background of the event and a little on snow squalls. So snow squalls can be more dangerous than a winter storm. Um, and what are they exactly? They're intense short-lived bursts of heavy snow that lead to a quick reduction in visibility that are often accompanied by gusty winds. So you have your threats of the rapidly changing visibilities and whiteout conditions that also have the slick snow ice-covered roadways. And then those can lead to these high-speed accidents um, and unfortunately fatalities and injuries. So with the snow squall warning coming on board here, it's an impact-based product, and therefore the messaging is also based on our impact. So we have three different cases there up on the screen, a more traditional snow squall case, a similar setup missing the wind comp component, and also another similar setup um, missing the cool pavement temperatures. And this goes to show that you can have really similar meteorological setups that can have vastly different impacts. So we're going to focus today on the March 8th 2018 event, but showing there that uh, even without the uh, typical wind component that you would see with many snow squalls, um, that you can still have just as many impacts as your traditional snow squall cases. And these uh, crash statistics are then parsed out based off of actual snow. So focusing on the impacts with these, we have, again, the three different events showing that they're all these different banded, we had banded orientation with each case. So very similar in um, setup and then very similar in what actually occurred with um, the band moving through, but then the different impacts. And another important part of snow squalls is messaging and making sure getting the message out there and the awareness, situational awareness to um, the public. And one way that we have done that uh, is NWS offices for Ohio partnered with the Ohio Department of Transportation uh, to promote awareness with these snow squalls and uh, have snow squall information, um, action items for the public on the road signs based off of what was the snow squall special weather statements and now the snow squall warnings. So this is just another tool in addition to social media and our products is utilizing our partnerships for the messaging aspect of snow squalls. And there are many different things that go into what makes for um, a snow squall event with impact and all these things on the screen show different things that can lead to uh, an impactful snow squall event. Now you don't need to have all of these elements in order to have impacts. Um, and the, the different um, items here that are highlighted in yellow are ones that this particular event had. Um, really focusing in on the pavement temperatures below 35 and some of the research that has been done locally here, um, looking at, you know, going more deeply into these different elements and um, 
not all these elements are created equal, and some have much uh, lead to much more impact or much more um, important than others. Um, going on to the next slide, we'll have a time lapse here, and going through, I take a little bit of time to load there on your screen, but there's a little yellow um, circles there, maybe ones or twos or uh, one case five, and what this is showing is the different injuries that occurred with accidents um, with this event. And so the time frame on this um, this loop here goes from about 5:30 Z to around 17 Z, and then we have the local time there on the right of when the actual uh, accidents occurred with this. So what we can see is that all three major metropolitan areas were affected at some point during the pre-dawn and morning rush hour, and that there were some accidents with the squall itself, but there are a lot of lingering accidents um, as well, and we'll go into that. And then during rush hour, we'll notice this one loop through Cincinnati, where we had a lot of impacts that occurred right with the snow squall as it moved through. So why exactly did that occur when we had the uh, um, both the impact with the squalls and a lot of lingering impact with accidents as well. Basically, uh, it created the situation where we had the snow squall that moved through and our pavement temperatures are just above freezing. Here we have this first red line where the actual snow squall moves through. And so the pavement temperatures just above freezing and melt the snow and the air temperatures below freezing causes this refreeze and this gradual cooling of our pavement temperatures um, where they go below freezing during the rush hour time frame. So that we have some of the immediate impacts and then a lot of lingering um, impacts during the overnight. And this was a March event, so the fact that it was during overnight allowed for this um, event to occur a little easier than um, that other March event that I'd indicated with the warmer pavement temperatures that occurred actually during the day. You can actually see here um, the icy surface uh, from this uh, event that actually was caused as the moved through and got the um, cooling of the pavement temperatures. That was just one of the three fatalities. The other two actually occurred at um, another point in time later, but had a very similar setup to this, where the actual fatality didn't actually occur with our snow itself, but actually occurred after the snow where we got the, uh, the refreezing of the um, surface there. So taking a quick closer look at the data, some important things to pick out with this um, is we have our PV anomaly. We have actually two features that you want to look for is this um, nice banded orientation coming through and right in advance of that with our initial uh, push of the banded snow. And then this other feature up here uh, around Lake Michigan that we're going to have to watch as it moves down into the area. So there's 9Z. And then looking at 12Z, uh, this is here during rush hour in advance of this next feature. Um, and also something with the, uh, the surface-based cape, it's important to uh, adjust your values for that because a lot of times your, your surface-based cape is around 100 or less. So adjusting it to maybe like a zero to 500 where you can really pick up on these lower values really highlights where um, your surface space cape is. In this case, the uh, last three values were relatively low. Again, the winds um, were not much of a factor with this event. Towards the tail end of the event, the winds started to pick up, but at that point we um, had the best snow squalls moving out of the area and our vorticity as well. Just moving forward once more here. Now we're getting into 15 Z later in the event. Um, and the second feature is moving into the um, Ohio area here. And then finishing off where now this feature is moving out. And at this point, looking at our radar, um, it's trying to scatter out. We don't have the nice banded features anymore with this feature moving off to the east. And this pretty much wraps up towards the end of the event. So now that we have a little bit of the background of the actual event, I'll um, give this back over to Kristen, and she'll go into more of the satellite aspects of the March 8th, this event. 
Thanks so much, Ashley. So uh, Ashley went over some of the uh, parameters, uh, generally the, the setup uh, for the event, and we're going to take a look at uh, some satellite products as the event unfolded. Um, this event posed a couple challenges for us. One, the snow squall, as Ashley mentioned, moved through during the overnight and early morning period leading up to and including the rush hour uh, across three metropolitan areas. Um, so from a satellite perspective, the typical daylight satellite products really couldn't be used or couldn't be used during the high impact part of this event. Uh, but as I will show later, um, the snow squalls did continue into the daylight, and we'll take a look at some, some products uh, once the sun finally uh, rose. Um, but of course, snow squalls by their nature, they tend to be shallow and form an environment without much horizontal variation in temperature. So the radar, from a radar perspective, you have relatively uniform reflectivity within the squalls themselves. Uh, but from a satellite perspective, the difference between, say, the squall sense temperature and the ambient environmental temperature is generally relatively small. So IR products do need some color scale enhancing to highlight features. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, you know, little, if any, liquid water would, would be present in, in some of these events. So um, sometimes bands such as the snow ice near IR band, which take advantage of refractive differences between liquid water and ice crystals, might uh, lose their usefulness uh, just a little bit. Um, actually, already went through the synoptic scale setup, so I won't spend too much time on this, but you do have substantial digging of a long wave trough axis across the Ohio Valley. Uh, but more importantly, you have an Im embedded potent Vortmax that's pivoting around the upper level low, uh, corresponding to a distinct PV anomaly on the 1.5 PVU surface. So this is a NAM forecast of 1.5 PVU wind and pressure. Um, this is at 9Z on March 8th, and then as we uh, go through time a little bit, you can see how things evolve uh, through 12Z. Um, but really what we want to highlight is the gradients here. The, uh, there are two distinct areas of sharp pressure gradients on the 1.5 PVE surface that will serve as uh, really a, a focused area for forcing um, that will help initiate and keep these snow squalls going as they progress through the area. So on the left here we have that uh, same uh, NAM forecast here. And uh, we decided to take a look at Channel 8. What does Channel 8 show? Well, it can be particularly useful in identifying areas of tropopod folding. And in fact, we see that there's a well-defined enhancement of upper-level water vapor that was coincident with the axis of strongest forcing, kind of uh, overlapping very well with that gradient that we see um, according to the NAM. And of course, you can see where your secondary uh, shortwave is. We go through time, this is at 12Z. There's your initial area of forcing and lift for snow squalls. Um, and as we kind of go through the radar here, we'll show that there were actually two distinct areas of snow squalls in the most impactful time, um, which again was from say about 7Z to about 12 or 13Z. Um, but notice here you also have an elongated enhancement of upper level water vapor that is a coincidence with the axis of strongest forcing. Again, along a gradient there. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind, just looking for a general setup perspective. Um, and there's your secondary shortwave as well. So taking a look at radar versus satellite imagery, this was uh, kind of the first main squall that moved through. On the left, you have radar imagery at 813Z. And it shows a well-defined squall with a tight reflectivity gradient uh, with some returns in excess of 30 dBZ. And on the right, we have uh, channel 13, which is clean uh, long wave IR. Um, and we did uh, change the color scale to essentially go from minus nine, uh, excuse me, minus nine to minus 40. Um, it shows a less defined cloud shield with coldest temperatures north and west of the actual squall location. I'm kind of looking um, right, right there. And you can see it doesn't really line up too well um, with uh, what we're seeing on radar. But uh, if we take a little bit closer look at the snow squall itself, uh, channel 13, the brightest and coldest colors do align somewhat with the squall location as depicted on radar. But there's some other cold temperature sense in the area. So identify, identification of this particular squall with channel 13 satellite alone would have been more challenging. 
Um, and additionally, the, the location of the coldest cloud tops didn't match well with the strongest radar returns. Um, however, I will say that uh, utilization of the BTV snow squall color curve uh, may help uh, highlight those features a little bit more, might show you where the strongest cores are. So that's something to keep in mind going through the winter. I do recommend that you download it uh, to your site and have it at your disposal during these types of events. One thing to keep in mind, actually had mentioned uh, the advent of uh, you know more widespread snow squall warning issuance this winter. Um, snow squall warnings, of course, will be a part of the walk winter training. Um, but it's important to keep in mind, as with convective events, uh, you know potential parallax issues that might uh, pop up from time to time, especially the farther north and west you go. So let's take a look at the, the second primary squall that caused impacts. This one moves through the Cincinnati metro area from approximately 6.30 to 7.30 a.m. local time, which of course is right in the thick of the rush hour, and it caused numerous accidents throughout the metropolitan area. Um, really the timing of it and the fact, as Ashley mentioned, um, it was March, and so typically if you get the sun up, you get warming of the road temperatures a little bit more, but at this point um, it still uh, was, was fairly dark, and so that the temperatures on the roads were still relatively cold. So if we take a kind of a zoomed-in look at this squall moving through the Cincinnati metro area, um, you can see cirrus uh, on the right. You can see some cirrus streaming by from northwest to southeast in this tri-state area of Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. Um, but it's you know it's obscured kind of the main interest of right when the squall was moving through the metropolitan area. So at first glance, it might look okay. Well, your coldest cloud tops align fairly well with where your snow squall is actually located, when in fact. Um, as we kind of step through time here, you can notice that the coldest cloud tops here on, on the bottom, um, it's actually cirrus just kind of streaming overhead. And so that kind of obscured our view a little bit if we're just uh, taking a look at Channel 13. Um, but again, the BTV snow squall, snow squall color curve may um, alleviate uh, some of these issues and may help highlight uh, snow, the most intense snow squall activity. That's something to keep in mind. But let's go ahead and fast forward to the daytime hours to see if there are any interesting uh, imagery can be used for snow squall detection during the daylight hours. Because like I mentioned, the, the uh, most impactful time of this event uh, was prior to the sun rising. But let's go ahead and take a look at some things later in the day. We've now kind of fast forwarded to 15Z. And this is where really satellite uh, imagery can be can be useful. In particular, we took a look at the GO 16 day cloud phase distinction uh, RGB, who is particularly useful in identifying different types of uh, different cloud types and layers, especially if multiple exist at a given time. The day cloud distinction. Day cloud phase distinction RGB combines visible with IR and the snow ice band to help differentiate cloud types from snow. So this is how things look at about 15Z. Well, let's take a closer look here. Bare ground is going to appear as dark blue because you don't really have a red component. Uh, generally, ground is warmer in, in the IR. And you don't really have a contribution of green. Ground is generally not reflective in the visible channel. But you do have a moderate amount of blue because land is, again, somewhat reflective in the snow ice band. We take a look here at this little strip of green, particularly from eastern Indiana through western Ohio. Um, you have a lack of red component, which is warm in the IR band. But you also have moderate amounts of green because snow is, of course, very reflective in the visible band. And you have a low amount of blue because typically ice particles are not as reflective in the snow ice band. So snow on the ground is generally going to appear a little bit more green if you're taking a look at the day cloud phase distinction RGB. But you will notice a little bit farther east, we have some kind of yellowish green showing up here. And um, that really is kind of showing where you might be having snow bands occur. Uh, low clouds, of course, are relatively warm, so there is some red component and contribution to the IR band. 
Um, but there is some ice in the clouds, so there is a low amount of contribution from the blue with pure water. It's going to appear more kind of gray and aqua in appearance. And uh, if you combine kind of bright green and yellow, if you're seeing this greenish yellow, um, typically that would kind of tip you off to ice processes occurring within the clouds. And so that's kind of a way, you know, if you didn't have radar, if your radar went out or possibly you were overshooting some of the strongest echoes, which often does happen uh, when, you know, snow squalls are generally very shallow in nature. So for those CWAs that may not have as widespread radar coverage and they're not scanning as low, um, this is certainly something that they can keep in mind um, to really see where you have your ice processes occurring uh, within the clouds. So if we take a look at visible satellite imagery, well, it's not really telling us much, of course, uh, and when you are really wanting to see where the snow squalls are actually located, but you compare that to the day cloud phase distinction RGB, and uh, certainly you are given more information about where your snow squalls may be located at that given time. And as we compare it with radar, you can see that the green-yellow hues do line up fairly well with what was appearing on traditional radar. And so if we kind of click through here, just kind of a quick um, animation to show you uh, some products that you would be looking at in a typical snow squall uh, situation, and certainly the uh, day cloud phase distinction RGB stands out. And so some takeaways from looking at this event from a satellite perspective. Well, of course, water vapor imagery, uh, Channel 8 specifically, is very useful for identifying and tracking PV anomalies and tropal pop folds, which of course will serve as your forcing for snow squalls. It aids, of course, by looking at this aids in the conceptualization of where the greatest source for lift will propagate, which will help forecast your confidence in not only where the uh, strongest squalls could develop, but where they will track through time, which of course is very important for providing uh, lead time and uh, enhancing your messaging prior to these events. Um, of course, the convective characteristic and corresponding IR presentation of snow squalls is generally more muted than you would see in the warm in warm season convection um, channel 13. Specifically within the minus 40 to minus 9 range can help show suggest where the snow shower and snow squall activity is tracking, but may not be as useful as traditional radar interrogation techniques. Again, um, you might want to check out the BTV snow squall color curve uh, to see if that may highlight some features um, here. But uh, channel 13 still can be used where your radar data may be overshooting the strongest echoes and can be used as a supplementary data set in conjunction with radar data. But as we saw, um, due, to, due to parallax issues, as is the case with traditional warm season convective short fuse warning situations, snow squall warnings should always be issued based on a combination of both radar and satellite data when available, um, but your day cloud phase or day cloud Convection RGBs can be used during daylight hours to help assess glaciation rate within the snow squall convection. But as we saw, the day cloud phase distinction RGB, because it has a visible component, it requires daylight. However, the bright green yellow hues can be used to identify areas of snow squalls, especially in the absence of traditional radar data. Um, and these bright green yellow hues indicate that ice processes are ongoing within the clouds, so there is uh, some components from both green and blue due to the presence of ice opposed to just pure water. Um, we want to thank you for, uh, for listening in and we'll happily take any questions that you might have at this time. Anybody have questions for Kristen or Ashley? Yeah, hey Dan, it's Brian. I have a question for uh, both. Um, did did you end up using uh, lightning at all to um, identify the more active snow squalls? We did not. Uh, unfortunately, we did not uh, have access to any um, you know GLM data at that time. 
Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure that there was any electrical um, activity within the snow squalls. Um, again, it, you know, really what what we were seeing from from an environmental perspective is one of the reasons this event was particularly impactful was that combination of that melting snow uh, on the pavement and then the refreezing. Uh, you know, when you have your pavement temperatures and air temperatures, uh, you know, a pretty big difference there. You get that snow to initially melt and then refreeze, and unfortunately that resulted in some pretty widespread impacts. Uh, but we did not look at that, but certainly that's something with the GOM that we'll be keeping an eye on uh, for future events. Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions? Okay, well, hearing none, I will turn it over to Brian to host any uh, general GOES questions. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, do we have any questions regarding the status of GOES 16 or GOES 17, uh, either the instruments or the products or the training? We're in the process of... Uh, formulating plans for the next year. So if uh, you guys have any suggestions on, you know, further um, training or topics or um, cases or, uh, uh, for instance, West cases or simulations, um, we could discuss those now. Anything in particular related to snow squalls? Did did um did uh, Ashley or Kristen? Did you guys do any special uh, seasonal readiness training for the snow squall warning at your office? Yes, we did. We uh, we did during our winter workshop. Um, this was part of a larger presentation that we had um, to our staff, going over specifics. Uh, I, I mentioned on that one page about the different components of what leads to um, particular events or uh, impactful snow squalls, um, incorporating some uh, local research that takes into account looking at, um, you know, situational awareness, identifying the actual uh, backgrounds, uh, looking at, you know, a lot of that, those images there with the NAM and everything, looking at a perspective of your working an event the day before, really trying to pick up on these events, and then uh, utilizing, you know, Metro Road model and different aspects to see if there's going to be conditional, you know, potential pavement issues, um, and also some of the preparedness as well uh, with our partners and um, especially Department of Transportation and our emergency managers and and having that um, understanding of what the snow squall warning is, when to utilize it, and when impactful snow squall events uh, could particularly be. So that way we message um, more so the ones that could potentially lead to impacts and not play at the ones that look like they're going to be very minor, if any, impacts at all. Very nice. So has it been well received by your customers and partners and uh, like for instance the the media outlets are they are they uh, quick to jump on these when they get issued yeah we've really had a good media feedback um especially you know if, as as we've gone more down you know really digging into the snow squalls over the last several years um and you know where you turn on the TV and everything several days in advance, and you know they're trying to educate the public on what a snow squall is and bringing awareness, you know that particular snow squall day is coming up and and relaying that information. So the media has been great um, for you know in getting that information out there and done several media interviews um, on snow squalls this fall on what the the snow squall warning is, what snow squalls are, what actions you should take uh, with snow squalls. 
So really, um, the media has been great in working with our other partners as well and getting that word out in different ways. All right. So, like, the picture on the right, it kind of looks like a, one of those sub, uh, sub-warning sub criteria or sub-advisory but maybe high-impact sort of scenarios. Right. How, do you, how do you handle those if, I mean, you, you want to issue. You want to be judicious about issuing snow squall warnings, but you could have, you know, uh, enough snow at like a rush hour time frame that it creates a high impact. Well, and that's one thing with snow squalls is that typically you aren't looking at these events where you're expecting a whole lot of snow. Um, it's just it's a short burst of snow. So what it actually looks like on the ground um, is that it doesn't you know, necessarily look like that much. And that's what makes them um, so, so much more, you know, having to get that information out there. You have a winter storm warning out for a traditional snowstorm that brings four to six inches, and people pretty much know that, all right, they're going to have to go slower. Where in this case, you know, this is the one picture on the right. It's actually several hours after the event because this one has a lingering impact. Um, but we're still seeing all these traffic Impact. So one thing that we've talked about is, you know, if you have um, if you have a snow squall moving through where you're expecting to have, um, you know, the a lot of impact with the squall itself, but then lingering impact as well is to issue a snow squall warning with the squall, but also potentially have a winter weather advisory out for these lingering effects. Um, when you have these cases here where, you know, rush hour, uh, even though the, the squall has already moved through, where we have these lingering effects. So sometimes, uh, you know, it's great with the addition of the snow squall warning, um, but we still have some of these lingering issues um, where it's a, a multi-product approach. All right, thanks. Uh, any other, any other um, discussion on... Training for uh, snow squall warning events. Um, I don't have a discussion on that, but this is Bernie from Sierra, and I have a question for either Kristen or Ashley, in terms of what um, you just said. Uh, say you have an event and there are lingering effects, and you still have a, a winter weather warning out. Um, do you think that occasionally the public might not understand what that really means? Uh, they might think, oh, the, the weather is, you know, the squall has already gone through. What are they talking about? Um, so have you thought about other ways to, in that case, word the warning of the lingering effects? Yeah, we, we have, and certainly there's uh, quite a large uh, educational component to this as we try to spread the word on uh, on the potential impacts and um, certainly, you know, social media is a great way that we can get this messaging out. Um, but traditionally, if if we're issuing a winter weather advisory, um, that will kind of, you know, advise the public to, to travel slow, to maybe add, you know, a little extra time to their commute. Um, so even though it might not actually be snowing, they might go, go out and, and see that conditions on the roads are, are pretty slick, too, and that's why our um, collaborative work with ODOT is so important. Um, when we issue these the snow squall warnings, um, you know, they'll have um, their signs that will kind of uh, give drivers a heads up of, you know, encountering these impactful uh, conditions. Um, but we do want to let the public know that these impactful conditions are going to last sometimes hours after the squall has already moved through. And so a winter weather advisory is a way to do that. So Social media messaging is a way to do that. Um, also, if we're expecting that temperatures after the squall is going to go through are going to remain below freezing, possibly drop, uh, which is typically the case, um, we can start messaging um, this information days ahead of time to try to alleviate some of what uh, has happened in the past where, unfortunately, you do have impacts last for hours. You have interstate shut down. Um, that's something that we're really striving to, to go against and to eliminate. And uh, really we're kind of exploring all options at this point to, to try to make sure that 
things like this don't happen quite as often because we do generally see these interstate shutdowns, these pileups with these types of events much more than if we were to get six or eight inches of snow. And it's just because of the, the awareness of it is it, not quite there, but that's what we're striving for. And also with the, the Pathfinder project with the Department of Transportation, um, and this is in several states, um, but it's also working with other types of messaging, not just with the snow school. So even if we have a winter weather advisory out, so there will be some messaging um, on, the, on the signs on the interstates there um, to still warn of hazards with uh, winter weather, even if uh, you know, the snow squall has, not already occur it has already occurred and um, you still have those lingering impacts, it may say you know, icy conditions or something like that. So there's still that other element of, of utilizing the, the road signs with our partnerships um, and also relying on you know, our, our other partners as well in getting that word out. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Uh, here, if there are no other questions, uh, we thank you for participating. Okay.